as I indicated, this event is sponsored by Brooklyn for Peace. Brooklyn for Peace is a 30-year-old, this is our 30th anniversary, um, educational and activist organization that has been uh, promoting peace, uh, alternatives to war and social justice in Brooklyn for a mere 30 years. Uh, we are an educational institution. So, and uh, because we don't believe that war is the real way to teach Americans geography, we thought you might find useful a map. Everybody should be able to find a map on their chair so you know something about where the various countries are in the Middle East. I'll get you more. And if, if, you, could name, if you could name the capital of Turkmenistan. David, are there any more maps? Right. There should be, there should be on your chair. There are there any more? If they're, if they're not on the chair, then I don't know that we have any more. Okay. All right. If you can name the capital of Turkmenistan, you get the gold of blue. Okay. Um, we are... We have to share. As I said, this is our 30th anniversary, and that things look a little different to us over the past year um, than they have previously. I would just note... Um, that there has been uh, a number of developments in our area that it's worth remembering and recounting about, and which, as it were, forms something of the background of tonight's discussion. There was a strong move to go bomb Syria that we were able to stop, which is really something to contemplate. There is the opening of actual negotiations uh, with Iran which despite the demands of the Israeli government and the neoconservatives seem to kind of sort of still be going forward. I know that you're going to be talking more about that. Um, uh, there, <laughs> there has been actually a cut in the military budget, albeit at a great social cost as part of the sequester. Um, there have been successes, really. uh, uh, notable successes from the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Um, that have really impacted uh, the way Israel uh, is perceived and has been perceived. Uh, we thought that um, given these disparate struggles and the complexities, that it was time to, as it were, take a step back and to look at this area and this region uh, more globally and with an overview, particularly with regard uh, to American uh, foreign policy. And there is no better person, no better qualified person to do that than Phyllis Bennis. We want to thank her for making the trip today in the face of numerous transportation obstacles and difficulties. Um, and she nevertheless did it, and we really do appreciate that. Um, she is the director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. She's also a fellow of the Transnational Institute. Um, she is a prolific commentator and author. I assume most people have heard her at one time or another. Uh, she is an author. We have books from Phyllis for sale. They'll be over there. You can get a discount. And even better, you can get an author's signature on your book. So there you are. Uh, she is, in fact, a precious resource for all of us in the anti-war and peace and social justice movements, um, and I give you um, Phyllis. Well, thank you all. I've got to say, it's really fun being back in Brooklyn. Um, I'm, there was never anything like the comments uh, when I lived in Brooklyn. I lived on State Street, just about two blocks away, and it was where, some of you will remember, there's these four old brownstones that are now historic monuments. It used to be that on both sides of those four brownstones there were vacant lots. That's where I lived, it was one of those brownstones. It was a Lawyers Guild group house for years. And I haven't been back since, and I hardly recognized it. So thank you for giving me the chance for that. And you can't afford to live there. Oh, please, I can't afford to live <laughs> But nonetheless, it, back in the day, it was kind of a great place. So I want to thank Brooklyn for Peace for putting this together. It's um, Brooklyn for Peace has an amazing history, and you all should be very proud at your 30th 
that we, we at IPS just celebrated our 50th anniversary, and it's been a schlep. <laughs> but 30 years for working for peace in Brooklyn is no easy task, so congratulations to all of you. I don't know if there's anybody here from the Grannies. I know they were one of the co-sponsors, and i got to yeah. say the Grannies are always... Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Among my favorites. And all of the other organizations that were involved in this, thank you for, for sort of taking the time to sort of try and think through some of this. This, oh, by the way, before I go any further, thank you for the maps. Maps are always good. And I'm going to pass around a piece of paper to sign, name and email. Please print, print clearly if you want to get my newsletter, which comes out about every three or four weeks whenever I'm at home long enough to write one. Um, so please do that. Thank you. You know, this is a sort of amazing time. Uh, it's an incredible time to be taking a step back and a deep breath and trying to sort out where we are in the Middle East and where the Middle East is at the moment in the world. There was a moment, some of you will remember, in the State of the Union address. How many of you sort of paid attention to the State of the Union, watched it or read it or something, a little bit? I know, it's, yeah. <laughs> there's a reason not to, but, but there is a reason to do it, because it does give an indication of what the administration is hoping they can shape over the next period. They often can't, but it gives you some sense of what they think they want to be accomplishing. And there was a, there was a moment when President Obama said, America must move off a permanent war footing. And I remember at that moment saying, wow. I mean, I said it out loud, it was like, wow. And, and it should have been a really wow moment. But then as he went on and, and sort of fleshed it out, the wow kind of, there wasn't much wow there. there. There wasn't much there there. It's a very challenging time. President Obama is faced with a very interesting conundrum. His strongest political base, the base that he can really count on, wants to end the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, wants to end the drone war, wants negotiations instead of war in Iran, and his advisors are pushing him in the other direction. He himself, I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows, and I'm not sure it really matters very much what he personally thinks. You know, there's been a lot of, oh my God, does he not get it? He used to get it, now he doesn't get it. And I don't know. I don't think that's all that useful for us trying to figure out, frankly. He's doing what he's doing, and that's what we've got to deal with. Whether he's agonizing about it, frankly, I'm not so interested. I'm interested in what he does. And what he's doing is pretty not good. I was going to say something else. It's clear that he's made decisions about which part of his base he thinks is important to be accountable to. So if you look, there have been some very important social movements in the last several years that have not only succeeded as we have succeeded, we in the peace movement, we in the movement against Israeli occupation, that whole set of our progressive movement have made some incredible gains in changing the discourse in this country. You know, we see amazing shifts in the number of people who think the war in Iraq was worth it, who think the war in Afghanistan was worth it, who are willing to challenge Israel in ways that nobody ever was before. On those levels, we've made incredible gains. But if we step back, we can see that there's a couple of other movements where they've made equivalent or even better gains than we have, who have seen those gains matched by real changes in policy. Particularly the gay and lesbian movement. I think that we see a very sharp uh, um, set of accomplishments, both in the discourse at the popular level and in, in the law. You know, it's coming out in court cases and in you know, the, the loss of these efforts in all these states to uh, to, to try and keep gay marriage illegal and all of that. Then you can look at the immigrant rights movement, somewhat different, a huge level of mobilization, a huge success in terms of normalizing the question of immigrant rights, reclaiming the idea of this as an a country of immigrants. And yet, we're not seeing it. You know, Obama is talking the talk on that one, but he's not acting. For us, he's not talking the talk. We don't have a claim of he's, he's you know, not following through on what he promised. He never promised us anything. He promised us to pull the troops out of Iraq. Then he tried to not do that, and then found he couldn't not do that, because the Iraqis wouldn't let him.
So we did it, and we claim credit, and that was right because it was made necessary because of our movement. <laughs> but on every other issue, the idea of the importance of a full withdrawal from Afghanistan, the importance of ending the drone war, the importance of delegitimizing war as an alternative to diplomacy, we're not yet there. We're not doing so well there. We have had gains. David spoke of a couple. Last summer, when we managed to halt the drive towards missile strikes in Syria, that was huge. That was huge. It was fast. It happened over six weeks. It was targeted at Congress. It was a very quick move. We were doing it in line with a broader global movement. You know, this whole thing started, the great Tony Benn, who just passed, uh, was, was part of the leadership of the Stop the War Coalition in Britain. Uh, when, you know, they were the first ones who made it clear that the Brits weren't going to be able to get away with supporting Obama on this one. And that's what changed Obama's mind. He was willing to go without NATO. He was willing to go without the UN. But apparently he wasn't willing to go without the Brits. And when they said no, he said, ay, ay, ay. Okay, we got to do this differently. So we turned it over to Congress, and we made it impossible for Congress to vote. That was a huge gain. That was a huge victory. And that had everything to do with how we have changed the discourse on the legitimacy of war as an answer to crisis. That's huge. The problem is, so, you know, we see this divide in the, in the Obama administration. He's accountable on a certain level on some domestic issues, a sort of center-left agenda on domestic issues, but a really right-wing agenda on issues of war and peace and, and, and uh, so-called security issues. You know, we're seeing it with the NSA, the, the administration defending these anti-whistleblower moves, and on and on and on. At a moment like this, it's extraordinary that as much as the press is focusing laser-like right now on, on Ukraine, we still don't see the kind of ability to mobilize in the streets that other movements have right now, and that we have at other periods. You know, the period in the run-up to the war in Iraq that culminated with the, the protests of February 15th, the day the world said no to war. I'm guessing everybody in this room was out in front of the UN that day. That whole period, through about 2007, protests were common. We didn't see much results from them immediately, but we did see the impact on what other people thought about those wars and the ability, our ability, to claim the right to define what is legitimate and what is not. The need to go away from war, to move away from war and towards diplomacy. But at the moment, we're seeing conditions on the ground in, you know, a huge swath of this part of the world, conditions on the ground <coughs> that are really pretty terrible and getting worse, not getting better. The changes that we're talking about are really still at the level of we're just starting. Because we all know, and if anybody needed more evidence, the <coughs> Citizens United decision gave us all the evidence we needed, that our democracy is so flawed and so broken that even massive shifts in public opinion are not enough to change the policy. So the challenge that we face, and the challenge that our movement faces, and this is, this is not new. I mean, some of you have heard me rant about this, been going on and on, around Iraq even. The, ch the transition between changing the discourse and changing the policy, there's a huge gap in between. And that's the struggle. It's not like we can say, we've won the discourse fight. Everybody's with us, and now we have to, you know. We're not there yet, but we are increasingly in that direction. This recent, most recent poll had 55% of people saying that the war in Afghanistan was not worth fighting. Now remember what it was like in, in 2001. Only, it was 88% of the people in this country said, go, cheerleading for war. It wasn't about justice, it was about vengeance. And everybody said, yeah, we want vengeance, man, that's our thing, you know. Now, 55% say it was not worth fighting. 68% say it should be ended, but, you know, that's been true for a while. But 55% saying it was never worth it, that's huge. That's huge. At the same time, we're seeing a new debate, once again, a crisis somewhere else in the world that can only be answered with military force. 
Now, on the one hand, you have people like McCain and, and Graham, the kind of the keynote of, of the anti-Obama forces in Congress, that are being very careful to say, we're not saying that we should use force against Russia. Pause. <laughs> With the unspoken yet. You know, and you think, are these guys out of their minds? You know, they are saying we should use force against Russia. What is this? They are certainly saying we should use force to support Ukraine. We should send military aid. We should consider sending troops. Maybe to Crimea, maybe not. I mean, it's, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. And the press, you know, these are the people who were so incredibly wrong, so totally wrong, so all-sidedly wrong, so overtly wrong, <laughs> just to say about Iraq. Yeah. Ask me later, and I'll tell you what I really think. But you know, it, it's sort of astonishing that they are still, they're still the same ones on the TV shows. They're the, still the same ones that are being quoted in the New York Times. I gotta say, the New York Times actually is changing rather dramatically mm -hmm. on a lot of this stuff. The Washington Post, not so much. But still, the, you know, there's still a credibility. It's, it's sort of similar, as some of you will know, the, you know the, the, these guys like Aaron David Miller and Dennis Ross, who have been responsible for 22 years of failed diplomacy in the Middle East, that's their credential. <laughs> this, is, this is David Aaron Miller. He's been responsible for U.S. policy in the Middle East for 22 years. Really? And you want to brag about that? <laughs> I mean, that's they just assert it as, as if it's like something to be proud of. It's, it's kind of amazing. But we really are now seeing discussions of what a new Cold War could look like. I don't think that's what is happening yet. I don't think this is a Cold War between the U.S. and Russia. But there is a battle underway, a battle for influence, which we saw beginning not around Ukraine, but around Syria. There are at least six wars being fought in Syria, only one of which is the war between a lot of the Syrian people, not all of them, but probably a majority by now, and the regime. That's one. There's five other wars being waged, one of which is a war between the U.S. and Russia mainly a war of words, but over control of sea lanes, over the significance and the legitimacy of, of the Russian base at Tartus versus the U.S. Uh, naval base in, in Bahrain. These are all issues that are, that are framing one of those six wars. So the tensions between the U.S. and Russia are far from resolved. All of the post-Cold War promises about the limits on NATO, the limits on the European Union. None of them meant anything. They have pushed the limits of NATO right up to the borders, right up to the borders of practically of Russia itself. They have pushed the EU. Uh, and when we hear that the US spent $5 billion in the last 10 years to, in, in supporting Ukrainian democracy organizations, we have to wonder. Now, I think. Part of the reason for standing back sometimes is to pull out the, the, the need for a, a nuanced understanding of things. There's no question in my mind that the U.S. Would, has tr been trying for 10 years or more to buy an opposition movement in the Ukraine that would overthrow a government and install a pro-U.S. government that would, try, that would pull away from Russia, that would you know, stop servicing the Russian transmission of, of uh, of natural gas to Europe, that would try and join the EU, that it someday would try and join NATO, all of that. But I think it's very careful that, it's very important that we be careful in how we assess that and not assume that because the U.S. tried to do that, that that means that all of those thousands of people that were out in the streets in Kiev are necessarily puppets of the United States. People have agency and people go into the streets for a whole host of reasons. And the US paying off a bunch of so-called democracy organizations isn't enough to get everybody into the streets. The same was true in, in, in Syria. The same was true in Libya. The fact that the US, in, in the later cases, tried to take advantage of a situation. In the case of Ukraine, they've already been there, you know, trying to stir it up. None of that means that there is no legitimacy to people rising up against terribly repressive governments. There was a move, some of you will, re will remember, in the early stages of the Syrian uprising. It faded, although it never really disappeared, to sort of say that the whole opposition <coughs> in Syria 
was a, a U.S. Zionist plot of some sort designed to, to overthrow the, the um, what was the term, the, the, the core of the axis of resistance across the Middle East. That, that the Syrian regime was, was key to Arab resistance standing up to American imperialism. That was never true. That was never true. This was a brutal regime under the father, and it's a brutal regime under the son that has been responsible for assaults on Palestinians. Some of you will remember in the 1970s, the Tel Azatar massacre of Palestinians, 1976. You will remember that Syria was the first Arab country to join George Bush Sr. in his assault on Iraq and sent Syrian planes to bomb Baghdad. Uh, you'll remember that the son agreed with the United States to serve as a an outsourcing place for torture and interrogation of prisoners during the global war on terror. This is not an anti-imperialist resistance anything. This is a dictatorship that talked the talk of resistance while oppressing its own people and a lot of others. That doesn't mean, on the other hand, that everybody on the other side is a good guy. We have to keep control of very nuanced understandings of these things. And there's no reason our movements can't do that. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can juggle several balls in the air at one time. We can condemn regimes that are brutal and condemn uh, U.S.-backed opposition to those regimes and say, these aren't the answers, that there are Syrian people, the, the original political opposition in Syria, who created a nonviolent movement and tried to make that work, whose voices were quickly drowned out by the violence on all sides. We can, we can say those are the people who probably got it right, but we also have to remember we can't always and probably shouldn't use a lot of time trying to find a counterpart everywhere. We have obligations as citizens for what our government does that are true regardless of what people in the victim country, if you will, are saying or doing at any given moment. So in Iraq, we had the obligation as citizens and taxpayers of this country, citizens who vote, taxpayers, everybody who pays those taxes, we were responsible for that horrific war in Iraq. We were responsible for the years of sanctions <coughs> that crippled and shredded the, the civil society of Iraq before that. And that was true even when a large part of the opposition stood for terrible things that we would never have supported. You know, this isn't the same as in, in the day, I'm looking around the room and seeing that most of you here remember the days when the opposition movement was somebody we would support. We didn't necessarily agree with everything they did, but we weren't just against U.S. support for apartheid. We supported the ANC. We weren't just against U.S. intervention in Nicaragua. We supported the Sandinistas. And on and on, in Angola, in, in El Salvador, in Mozambique, in all these places. It didn't mean we liked everything they did in the Liberation War but we could support the social program they stood for. That's often not the case anymore. And we have to figure out ways of building an anti-war movement that has solidarity at its core, that doesn't define solidarity in these narrow ways of, we have a counterpart, and solidarity means endorsing X movement in X country. You know, we have to figure out a more a, a, a complexity that reflects the complexity of the world that we, that we live in. Right now, global conditions that we're looking at are characterized by wars that are getting hotter, occupations that are getting worse, the possibility of new Cold War relations potentially emerging, these new tensions between Russia and the US. And I think that we have to look not only at the danger of that set of, of contradictions between Moscow and Washington, but also what's going to be the impact on the talks in Iran? What's going to be the impact on Syria? Is there now no chance that the Syrian talks can be re resumed? Because why should Russia do anything to cooperate with the U.S. when the U.S. is threatening new sanctions on Russia? It makes everything more complicated, everything more difficult. But I think that this notion that the U.S. still needs Russia as an ally in some parts of the world, like in Syria, like in Iran, is still acting, for the moment, it may not last, but somewhat of a break on the drive of those 
who are calling for escalation, for greater militarization of these conflicts. Because remember, what are the domestic pressures that we're seeing? The Republicans en masse are taking the line that the, the New York Times this morning had that very good piece on, this is what I was doing on the train, which was two hours late today, just so you all know. Yeah. I was reading the New York Times, and there was that very good piece on the, the, um, uh, the, the kind of pressures on the Obama administration from all those who think that Obama is weak and what that is doing around the world. It was very, I mean, I didn't obviously agree with all of it, but it, it raised some very interesting voices in there. So the Republicans in general have never seen a Democrat <coughs> that, you know, is, is war, a warmonger enough to keep them happy. Then you have these lunatics like uh, McCain and, and um, I'm blocking his name, Graham, 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 thank you, uh, that, you know, want every war to be escalated greater and stronger. And the neoconservative movement, which is not in power, but they don't seem to know that. And the press doesn't seem to know that. They're not in the White House. They're not in the Pentagon. They're not in these policy positions in the government. They're back in their cages in, you know, in, her in heritage and wherever they are. But they're talking and writing as if they were calling the shots, you know. And neither Obama nor anybody else is, is saying a word to say, excuse me, you people. You were voted out. Remember? Go back in your cage. Be quiet. <laughs> Nobody is saying that. It's as if they have to be placated. And they, it takes blood to placate them. So that's a very <coughs> dangerous, uh, it's a very dangerous thing. There are, you know, there are threats from the liberals, the liberal interventionists. Now they are in power. When you have Samantha Power at the UN and, and um, Susan, Susan Rice. Rice in her position as national security advisor, this is bad. Yeah. You know, these are the ones who sort of wrote the book for Libya, among other things. These are people who have never seen a, a, a human rights violation that didn't require a military response to deal with it. And that's who Obama chose to listen to. That's who he chose to be his advisors. That's a really bad sign. So we're dealing with these pressures from a lot of different positions. I think that we need to constantly hold up the victory of preventing the missile strikes against uh, against Syria. That was huge. Because all these various forces wanted that. The liberal interventionists wanted it. The neocons wanted it. The lunatics in Congress wanted it. The base of the Republican Party and half the Democrats wanted it. A lot of people wanted it. And the fact that it didn't happen is a huge accomplishment. We should hold that up at every moment and savor it as a victory. But even there, we also should remember that that probably would not have happened at least as quickly and as completely were it not for the mobilization against it on the right. There was a big right-wing opposition. I think that we, our movement in those six weeks did exactly the right thing, what, which was to recognize that that was going on, not engage with those people, not try and unite with them, not try and have joint strange bedfellow coalitions or whatever, not waste our time on any of that but recognize that they were a huge power in Congress. Because all these right-wing Tea Party types and regular old right-wing normal people in the Congress were also getting calls from the right, from the isolationist right, from the racist right, who were saying that not one drop of American blood should be, should be spent on these people. You know, that, that nothing in Syria is worth one drop of American blood. It's a horrific reality. But that was, that was there, and we have to acknowledge that. Our movement alone is not yet in the kind of position to call the shots on these things. So we have to be very sanguine about that. <coughs> the military, interestingly, is not pushing for new wars in the main, the, the leadership. They, they want to continue in Afghanistan. They don't want to, quote, lose their accomplishments. Uh, but they're not pushing for new wars. They're not pushing for escalation in Afghanistan. But there are plenty of others who are. In Afghanistan, of course, the, the military wants to keep somewhere around 10 to 12,000 troops. They would only, of course, be involved in training. Training to do what exactly? We're not being told. And counterterrorism, <coughs> which means they want to just stay there and kill people. No claims that this is a counterinsurgency. No effort to win hearts and minds. We're not doing that anymore. This is about, we're going to go kill bad guys. 
And don't ask any questions about who the bad guys are. We know who the bad guys are. We're going to kill them. And if a few other people get killed in the meantime, that's just too bad. That's essentially the military position. The White House wants three to 5,000 troops to remain. How they can, with a straight face, claim that if we don't have at least that, we, we are threatened with the possibility of losing all that we've accomplished. When 150,000 troops occupying the entire country couldn't accomplish what they claim they wanted to accomplish, what do they think 3,000 troops are going to do? I mean, it's, it, it's kind of nutty, but that's kind of what we're dealing with. Now, one of the other big sources pushing towards war is Israel, and their supporters here led by APEC. Now that, it's, it's framed by a desire to consolidate even tighter, if one could imagine, the U.S.-Israeli relationship based on this notion that they, they want the U.S. to partner with Isra Israel as the regional and the U.S. as the global police, as the core of a Western alliance, as the core of a Western empire. That's what this new decision that was passed in Congress last week, calling Israel for the first time for any country a strategic ally. They invented this whole new category. Nobody knows what it means. None of our NATO allies are strategic allies. You know, it seems maybe to have something to do. You know, you've all been following this debate about whether the ultra orthodox will be drafted in Israel. Yeah. How many people here know whether Canada has a draft? Who knows whether Great Britain has a draft? All of our allies. We don't even know if they have a draft, and we don't care, right? And yet, we're all engaged in the minutia of whether this small cohort of ultra-Orthodox Israelis are going to be drafted or not. Why do we care? This is not our business. It's our business because APAC and others have made everything that happens in Israel our business. And it has something to do with this idea of Israel as a strategic ally. I'm not sure if it makes us stronger or weaker if we have all the yeshiva boys in the army or out of the army, I'm not sure. But whatever, we're all hearing way more about it than I think we really need to. But, ultra-Orthodox aside, the role of Israel in APAC is very, very critical right now. The good news comes here. The good news is APAC is on the run. APAC is on the defensive in a way that they have not been, I would say, since before 1967. Now, having said that, I want to qualify. Remember, nuance here. They are still very powerful. They represent the right wing of the Jewish community across the country, and not surprisingly, like the right wing of every constituency, that's where the money is. So they have a lot of money to pass around. They have a lot of money to threaten members of Congress, and we all know how they do it. They're, they're quite subtle also. They're not the usual, you know, most lobbies, they go and they say, if you toe the line on what we want, we'll give you X millions in your, in your campaign. APAC and its minions, it's the, the, small, the small lobby groups that APAC kind of tells what to do. APAC, by the way, as you know, does not itself give money. They're not a, an official grant-making lobby. They coordinate what all the small lobbies do. And what they do is very different. They go to members of Congress and say, if you don't toe the line, we will find an opponent that you may never have even heard of yet, and we will fund them and you will lose. So it's a, it's a different kind of threat. And they have the money to do that. What they don't any longer have is two things that are very important. One is the ability to call the shots on how the Jewish community votes. I'm not really convinced they ever had that. But they used to claim it. They used to claim, if we tell the Jewish community in X city not to vote for you, you can kiss those votes goodbye. You know, it doesn't work that way anymore. As I say, I'm not sure it ever did, but they used to pretend it did. They can't even pretend that anymore. The other thing they've lost is legitimacy. The reality of Israel's occupations is now so much better known in this country, partly because of the BDS movement and the work of organizations like the U.S. Campaign to End Israeli Occupation, which I think Brooklyn for Peace is a proud member of, mm -hmm. uh, along with more than 400 others. I mean, imagine, when we started the U.S. Campaign, it had 11 organizations, I think. Uh, now it has over 400. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's mainstream now. The idea of boycotts is becoming, the mainstream churches have taken it up. The rabbinical council of Jewish Voice for Peace has more rabbis than I think APAC can count on. They also have about as many members. 
So the change in the Jewish community is huge. You know, it's no longer there's APAC and there's everybody else. Now, there's APAC on the right, there's J Street in the sort of center position, and there's Jewish Voice for Peace on the left. And they're contending, you know, quite, quite powerfully. But it's also a change in the country as a whole. When Israel attacked Lebanon, in, uh, attacked Gaza, sorry, in, in 2008, in that three, horrific three-week war, the first thing they tried to do was keep out all of the, all of the foreign press. And they were able to do that pretty well. They were able to keep out the Washington Post, and they kept out CBS. But they couldn't keep out all the Gazans who have cell phones, who when there was a minute when electricity came on, the first thing people would do is power up their cell phones so they could get more video and send it out into the world. They couldn't keep out the New York Times, because the New York Times had Tagrid El Khoderi, this terrific young Gazan woman, who was their stringer, who lived in Gaza with her parents. They couldn't keep out Al Jazeera because Al Jazeera had a whole team of Gazans. They were already there. They couldn't keep them out. It transformed how the world came to see what Israel was doing. And that has had a huge impact. So when, when APAC takes the lead, as it did last summer, in pushing for the strikes on Syria, and it doesn't happen, that really shows APAC's weakness. But it also shows that they're weak when they push for things that are against the interests of people in this country. They can get away so far with supporting military aid to Israel. That's something, ironically, this year for the first time, that was, on, that was one of the asks on their lobby day. You know, you go to lobby day just like you guys do, and you have a list of asks. This is what you want to ask everybody in Congress. They brought thousands of their members to their big conference in Washington and then turned them loose in, in uh, in Congress to go meet with all their members. They met with, I'm sure, all 435 members of the House and probably most of the, the members of the Senate. And they had a list of five or six asks. Number two or three was, be sure and give Israel, again, $3.2 billion in military aid. That was never a question. They passed that years ago as a 10-year grant. It's already there. They don't have to press for that. But the fact that it was one of their asks means they're feeling defensive. That's huge. This is this is what's now being undermined. When we look at the, the, how far we have to go, there's a long way, but things are changing. The, the drone wars, the drone wars is now Obama's signature war. Whatever he was, you know, whatever he took, whatever he inherited from the Bush administration, he has made the drone war his own. He has expanded it geographically, he has deepened it, so it's happening more, he has been more overt about not caring about civilian casualties, and the result has been a huge escalation in civilian casualties and in the numbers of people in the, if I can say it with a straight face, the kill meetings every Tuesday morning. This is the first White House that has admitted that every Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. they have the kill and capture meeting to refine the list of who can be killed and captured according to this administration. In the State of the Union, President Obama said, we need prudent limitations on the drone war. And he said, and I, I have the quote here, we will not be safer if people abroad believe we strike within their countries without regard for the consequences. But the problem is we do strike within their countries without regard for the consequences. I mean, look at the bin Laden strike, the one that everybody thinks that was the clean one. You know, Of course, they didn't even have to kill him. He hadn't resisted, but that aside, one of the results of that, of that attack was that, hun not hundreds, <coughs> scores so far of Pakistani health workers have been killed by extremists who are crazy in their own way, certainly, who believe that they are part of a plot against Muslim children because of vaccination campaigns. Well, on the one hand, you could say, oh, they're nuts, that, you know, these people are crazy. Well, you could say that, except for the fact that it was true in that attack, before they knew for sure that it was bin Laden that they were going after, they wanted to check DNA. How are they going to get into this place, to, into this, co into this um, compound. Uh, compound, thank you, into this compound to check the DNA? You can't just knock at the door and say, hello, we're the CIA, could we get a, a, a skin squad, please? So what did they do? They hired Pakistani doctors to launch a vaccination campaign to get all the children in that area to be vaccinated. And they used that. They knew there were children in that, in that compound, and they assumed that they were somehow related to bin Laden. It turned out they were. 
and that's how they made the confirmation. And then it becomes public. The doctor who was in charge of it is still in prison in Pakistan. But more importantly, the health workers can't do their job because they're being killed by people who think they're still doing that. And that's not so unreasonable, you know, when you think about it. So the only prudent approach to the, to the drone war, obviously, is to end it, not to tinker with it. That has to be central to our own understanding of how to end these wars. <coughs> we heard a lot in the State of the Union about the need to re redefine our military. There was talk of cutting the military budget. That's all good. But we didn't hear plans. How, here, there's ways they can cut the military budget without even noticing it from their vantage point. They could close down all 700 plus U.S. military bases around the world. There's no domestic constituency for those the way there is for the domestic bases. You know, you try and close a base in this country, and you're going to run up against all kinds of problems from the members of Congress, from anybody who has jobs there, all those things. There's more than 700. There used to be over 1,000, but there were about 300 of them were in Iraq, and they were closed down. There's more than 700 U.S. military bases. They don't make us safe. They're destroying the environment in all of the countries where they're located. They're creating huge social contradictions, issues of rape and violence from U.S. soldiers in all these areas, they could close those down and the world would cheer. And they would save billions, but they're not talking about that. They're not talking about canceling these wasting, wasteful uh, weapon systems. They're not talking about ending the wars. These are all the ways to cut military spending, you know, without raising the health care premiums of, of low-paid low soldiers. So this is kind of the, the set of contradictions of, of what we're, you know, what we're looking at. The question of where we go from here. What David mentioned is very important, that we're looking at a moment when there are real <coughs> efforts underway to move towards diplomacy instead of war. The Iran talks are probably the most important in that way. There is the possibility that there, we could come out of this process with a real grand bargain as people used to talk about, with a permanent agreement between the U.S. and Iran. We can talk all we want about the P5 plus 1, blah, 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 but this is really about the U.S. and Iran. There could be a real agreement. Iran is prepared to make all kinds of concessions on its, military, on its, on its um, nuclear power program. It's made that clear. As President Obama reminded us just the other day, 95% of the sanctions, these crippling sanctions that the U.S. and, and the international community have imposed, are still in, in place. They only lifted 5% of the sanctions. Iran gained almost nothing for the interim period. The U.S. gained almost everything, the U.S. and its allies. But right now, the White House is standing very firm. You know, the kicker here was when, when Obama said the other day that if Congress sends me a new sanctions bill, I will veto it. That was huge, because he doesn't usually make those kinds of explicit promises. He makes them vague and wordy and, you know, negotiable. This was pretty non-negotiable. So that, I think, was, was very important. But the White House could still lose. Menendez is still out there trying to get his new sanctions bill, 1801, passed. Now, they're saying, well, right now, this was the big pullback for APEC. Over the, uh, not over the summer, in the fall, APEC explicitly pulled back and said, okay, we don't need this right now, but let's leave it in the, in the, in the tiller for, for later. We'll come back to it. APEC is still pressuring. Harry Reid is saying he won't bring it to the floor of, of, the, of the Senate. That could, uh, that could collapse. The veto threat could collapse. The 70 members of the House who have said they will not support any new sanctions, that could collapse. You know, all it could take is some orchestrated terrorist attack somewhere against a ship or something blamed on Iran that could melt away in a minute. So we can't take any of this for granted, that the possibility of a real negotiation could lead to a real peace agreement. Imagine a real reduction of tension, maybe even a normalization of relations between the U.S. and Iran. Now, why is Israel so rabid about this? Why are they so terrified? The, the language is, Iran is an existential threat to the state of Israel, and Iran, as with a nuclear weapon, would be an existential threat to the entire region. Well, Iran, even with a nuclear weapon, and I'll get in a minute to why 
they probably don't even want a nuclear weapon. Right. But even Iran with a nuclear weapon would not be an existential threat to Israel. It would be an existential threat to Israel's nuclear weapons monopoly in mm -hmm. the region that it has had since 1979. That was when it first tested its first nuclear weapons with apartheid South Africa off the African coast. <coughs> and it's in that context that the Israeli threat is real. Now, the notion that everybody knows Iran really wants a nuclear weapon, they're just trying to hide it or they're just waiting, they want breakout capacity, all this stuff. One of the things that people are forgetting is that the Iranian leadership has to answer to a very engaged population. It doesn't mean it's not a very repressive regime in a whole host of ways. It is. But it is not a military dictatorship where there is no pressure, there's no fight back against the policies of the government. There is huge opposition from all kinds of places, from the right, from the left, from within the clerical establishment, from secular forces, from all over the place. And one of the things that every Iranian leader since the Ayatollah Khomeini when the Iranian revolution first took power, has been consistent on, is that a nuclear weapon would be a violation of morality and of Islamic law. Now, we can sit here and say, ah, nobody believes that. You know, it's not even true. And on one level, of course, it's not true. There was no such thing. When, Iran when Islamic law was written you know, in the year 700, there was no such thing as a nuclear weapon. So yeah, they don't prohibit nuclear weapons. Thank you. But, What's important about that is, in the Iranian political context, it would be very, very difficult for any president or any clerical leader, any ayatollah, to suddenly reverse 30 years of this commitment that this is a huge violation of our morality and our Islamic law, and say, oh, sorry, we were wrong. It's not a violation. That would be, it's not to say it could never under any circumstances happen, but it is something that would be very, very difficult for any government to do that and stay in power. So that has to be, that has to be thought about. You know, we tend to not, in this country, take very seriously that any other government has political accountability that they have to take into account. Well, they do. And in Iran, that's one of them. So I think that's an important thing that we have to, that we have to keep in mind. Now, the other side, of course, of the APAC role and, and why it's significant <coughs> <coughs> that APEC is, is in many ways on the defensive, is lashing out in some ways because they're on the defensive. It's not like they're pulling back and going gently, you know, they're doing quite the opposite. But on the question of Israel-Palestine, the Kerry talks, you know, are underway. They're scheduled to, to uh, be brought to an end around the end of April. And there we have a couple of serious problems. One of which is, my, my great fear is that if somehow President Obama manages to pull off a real agreement with Iran, a real comprehensive uh, negotiation with a grand bargain, that there will have to be a price paid to Israel. And the price will be paid in Palestinian rights. That's my fear. That if we get an agreement with Iran, that any hope of anything that any remote support might ever come from the US government for Palestinian rights will disappear. That's, that's my great fear. Now, that doesn't mean we should stop working for a comprehensive settlement with Iran. It is way too important not to. But we just have to keep in mind that there's other parts of it that we have to keep in mind as well. You know, it's juggling three balls at a time, or six. I hope people are better jugglers than I am. I always used to drop the balls. The carry talks, I've been calling them the Einstein edition. Why? Because the line that Einstein famously said that if you're you know, that the definition of insanity is if you're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I don't quite get it. Kerry's a very smart guy. He was the head of the, the uh, Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate for how many years? He's no idiot. He, he knows kind of what the forces are. And yet, he still seems to think that he can go in and do the same thing with the same set of negotiations based on maintaining Israeli power and that somehow this time it's going to work. I got news for him. It's not. It's, I can promise you that. It's not. There's three possibilities that we're going to see. None of them are very good. One is, probably the least likely, we'll hear an announcement that we couldn't do anything, the talks are over, you know, the, the current situation is going to be what it is for however long. 
almost certainly not going to happen because this is really a lot about legacies, including Kerry's legacy. Now that he knows he's never going to be president, he wants a legacy. He wants a photo on the White House lawn. He wants all that stuff, as does President Obama. You know, I think he still thinks, for God knows what reason, that this is maybe his best shot at a foreign policy legacy. Second possibility, they'll come in and say, great victory. <clears throat> great victory. We're going to extend another year. Oh, good. Now we're going to have 22 years of failed diplomacy turn into 23. Isn't that something to cheer about? I think that's a pretty likely one, actually. The other possibility, I give it maybe 60%, they're going to come in and say, we have a framework agreement. It's a framework to begin talks in the future at another time that could lead under some circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Everything condition, condition, condition. And, oh, by the way, both sides agreed with, you know, with a few deferrals. They, they have some check marks of what they're, you know. And, in fact, they will have check marks at each line. So they will not be accountable to anything. And, of course, both sides have already decided, and the... The Knesset just voted on this again last week, that nothing can be passed without a popular referendum to support it. And what they're talking about passing, even if there was some agreement on the leadership, no one in the ground, either in Israel or in the Palestinian territories, and of course no one's asking the Palestinian refugees or Palestinians inside Israel, but nobody's prepared to vote for this thing. So it's kind of dead in the water. Excuse me. The substance of it that we're, that we're hearing, the problem, of course, that it's not based on international law, human rights, and equality. That's what it needs to be based on. That's how it could work. But it's not based on any of that. It's talking about the new one, the, the new edition just this year. The Palestinians have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, what's wrong with that? I mean, on one level, you could say Israel can call itself a Jewish state. It can call itself whatever it wants. It, you know, Iran rec calls itself the Islamic Republic. You can call yourself whatever you want. But having your opponent have to recognize the legitimacy of that means the Palestinians are being asked to recognize the legitimacy of continuing the third and fourth class status of Palestinian citizens of Israel. They're asked to say that those citizens legitimately have no right, that legitimately Israel would have the right to keep out Palestinian refugees who are not, who are not Jews. I mean, it's, 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 it's a known deal breaker. Everybody knows it. It may be why Netanyahu is pushing so hard on it, because he's he wants to be sure that the Palestinians are blamed. I don't think he has to worry about that. I think he can pretty much count on the Palestinians being blamed. Um, but then there's other problems with it. It deals only with the question of, of the West Bank and Gaza. It says basically nothing, as far as we know, about uh, uh, the, with the West Bank and Jerusalem. It says nothing about Gaza. It says that there will be a capital in Jerusalem, but as far as we know, they're going to talk about the expanded borders of Jerusalem that Israel has created. And I'm guessing that the, the, lucky, the lucky capital area is going to be the great historic city of Abu Dis, which, for those of you who haven't been there, is a dusty little village outside of Jerusalem where the Silk Road ends. The Silk Road ends there because the Silk Road, for the first time in over a thousand years, now dead ends at the wall, at the apartheid wall outside of Jerusalem. I'm betting Abu Dis. Uh, the wall, the route of the wall through the West Bank is likely to be the new border because if you notice the, the, that route and you superimpose it with a route of the, the aquifers, you'll see that the, the route was very carefully drawn to keep all the water on the Israeli side. So that's, you know, the likely, uh, the likely border. All of the, the major settlement blocks and 80% of the settlers, that's 80% of 600,000 illegal Israeli <coughs> settlers, will be on the Israeli side and that will be annexed. In return, the Palestinians might be offered, it's not clear what, either a little bit of desert land outside of Gaza, nobody is very sure where this land is allegedly going to come from, and even if it were going to be there, you know, the, the, the swap, right? You hear this all the time. Two say solution with swaps. You have to say it really fast. Two say solution with swaps. The swaps is supposed to be these enormous cities that are the settlements in return for something. We don't know what. Land somewhere. Permanent. Israeli military control of the Jordan Valley. That's 25% of the West Bank right there. And the IDF will be allowed the right of hot pursuit into Palestinian territory. This is a state, right? This is, this is supposedly a state. And of course, Israel will still have control of the airspace, control of the waters off the coast, control of entry and exit, and control of the borders. This is the state that we're talking about. In the meantime, the siege of Gaza has gotten worse and worse since the coup in Egypt last summer. 
what we're seeing is that the last remaining exit point for Gazans, the Rafa crossing, has been closed almost since last August. It's open a few times, a few uh, of the most crucial uh, uh, medical emergencies have been allowed out, but basically it's closed, which means Gaza is completely encircled. You know, it's completely enclosed in a giant prison. And the conditions you probably all heard about what happened to Medea Benjamin, uh, trying to get into, into uh, Egypt to go through Rafa to Gaza for International Women's Day. The whole delegation, of course, never got to Gaza. Only 17 out of 100 were allowed into, to exit the airport and go into, into Egypt, and they weren't able to, to, uh, to go to Gaza anyway. Uh, but there have been victories. The BDS victories are huge. The boycott, divestment, sanctions movement is growing in Europe. It's having real impact on the economy. The whole idea here was to bring nonviolent economic pressure to bear, and that's happening. You know, we have banks in the Netherlands, uh, the, the largest pension fund company in the Netherlands cut its ties with five Israeli banks. In Denmark, the largest Danish bank, black, blacklisted uh, bank Hapa'olim, the, the largest of the Israeli banks. Luxembourg, the government fen pension fund, is boycotting all Israeli companies because they're afraid of complicity in the occupation. Norway, the state investment uh, fund, is now boycotting the major Israeli construction companies because they're all working in the occupied territories. The boycott is expanding. The, you've all heard about the, the Scarlett mm -hmm. Johansson uh, thing with, with uh, SodaStream, one of the big targets of the, of the boycott. But there's also the uh, American Studies Association, the Native American Studies Association, and the Asian American Studies Association have all passed these boycott resolutions. It's the mainstreaming of BDS that is really extraordinary. So again, we're at the point where the discourse is changing, and our job is to make that stronger so that we can turn it into real change of the policy. The New York Times, I must say, for those of you New Yorkers, has really changed rather astonishingly. I mean, they've had this piece that Avi Schleim did, Israel Lear Needs to Learn Some Manners, which was exposing Kerry's initiative as, you know, as, as a fraud. They ran a piece by Omar Barghouti, who's the leader of the BDS movement in the Palestinian territories. Why Israel feel, fears the boycott. The Washington Post, arguably the most pro-Israeli of any of the major papers, has been. Run, they ran a piece on from Vijay Prashad on uh, why we should be supporting <coughs> the boycott. Why the the ASA was right. So this talk of a boycott, the, the Post said, is now in the mainstream. This is all good. So this whole debate over war versus diplomacy is, in the broad stream of things. The debate is happening. The problem is people in the White House and in Congress and in the Pentagon and in these think tanks are all in this Washington bubble and actually believe there is no alternative to these very mainstream failures that continue. So I, I want to end in a couple minutes so we can open up for discussion and questions and whatever, but just to look very quickly at what are our obligations as, as an anti-war movement, as a, a movement for peace and justice. The great Tony Benn, I think, always was the one who said it right. We have to educate, agitate, and organize. We have to provide the information about what is going on, which is already happening. Social media, the rise of the internet, all of that has made that work much easier than it used to be. Remember standing there with a mimeograph machine, cranking out the leaflets and passing them out at the subways? Now, with so much online, the education part doesn't mean that we don't have any responsibility. But it does mean that it makes, it, a lot e it makes our work a lot easier. Then we have the obligation to get people outraged about it. That's where the question of the economic consequences comes in. You know, if we look just at the military aid to Israel, in, the last, in these 10 years, where the U.S. is paying Israel $3.2 billion every year straight to their military, Brooklyn alone has paid $215 million of that. Now, that's not even, you all know the figures from the, the National Priorities Project of the cost of the war in Iraq, the cost of the war in Afghanistan, to Brooklyn, to New York State, $2.5 billion over these 10 years, to the Israeli military, straight out of your pocket to the Israeli military. I mean, if that doesn't get people outraged, people don't know that. People really don't know that we give that much money. Imagine. You know, $2.5 billion could go very far in this state towards health care, towards jobs, towards rebuilding the roads, for God's sakes, snow removal equipment. 
not caterpillar. You know, so that becomes so that becomes a very important part of it. So then there's the organizing. That's the, the important stage. That's where you get people mobilized to put the pressure on so that it, it's not just enough to say that, wow, it's no longer political suicide to criticize Israel. It's no longer political suicide to say we want diplomacy instead of war. It becomes political suicide not to say we want diplomacy instead of war. It becomes political suicide to say we should be giving money to the Israeli military. That's what we have to be aiming towards. And when we say organizing, it means real campaigns. Not going from event to event to event, but a campaign <coughs> that at the end of two years, we're going to accomplish X. And frankly, sometimes we accomplish it, sometimes we don't. But in the meantime, we have educated, we have agitated, and we have organized whole communities of people. <laughs>